Hey, everybody. Hey, good to see you. I can't see you, but thanks for being here anyway. I appreciate you joining, taking some time out of your day to attend this, another Sales Hacker webinar. Um, I'm excited for this one. This one's special. We've got a bunch of people here already. Over 1,200 people signed up for this. So your being here live gives you a chance to ask some really cool questions that I know people who watch the recording are being like, oh, darn, I wish I attended that. Um, so what are we doing? I'm your host. I'm Colin Campbell, the Director of Marketing at Sales Hacker, and we're talking about um, predictable revenues, no BS formula for outbound success. And no BS meaning like we're not going to talk about hustling or smiling, dialing too much. We're going to talk more about <laughs> using our mm -hmm. brains and kind of building or rebuilding from zero, like what's the strategy, like what's our messaging, who are we talking to, what's the strategy to reach those people, um, and the four pillars that really go into making something successful in like a scientific proven way. So we don't have to be us ourselves about like activity numbers. We have to know we're starting from the right place. And so to help us talk about that, we've got two really, really special guests. We've got Colin Stewart, who is the co-founder and co-CEO of Predictable Revenue. So first of all, Colin, thank you for being here. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Colin, with 1L. I, I'm really excited <laughs> to have you. And I was just going to say, for today, man, I will just be Campbell. Cool. I, you know, like the world has enough Collins. No offense. We don't, we don't need me, at least. We need you. Can we um, call you Colin? Because like, that's what happens when there's only one L. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> you, you are not, not anybody, but you too can call me anything you want. Um, Thanks, okay, honey. so <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, also joining us is Heather Burke, and you're the senior manager of sales development at Outreach. Um, yes, so, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Colin's coming in with some of the theory, some of the reasons why this is what we're talking about today, some of the frameworks that we can use. Heather's coming in with like her experience really running sales development at like one of the best sales organizations in the country, maybe the world. And um, we're going to talk challenges. We're going to tell some stories. We're going to talk about how we've won a few times in the in the past. And I, like you all, I'm really just along for the ride. I'm here to make you, the audience, do your job. So your job is, since you're in the live version, um, ask questions, right? You're here. You could watch the recording if you want, but you're here because you're going to um, gain something from this that you couldn't otherwise. So to do that, go down. A couple of people have done it already. Go down to the bottom of your screen. Click that chat icon. Make sure you're messaging to everybody, all panelists, all attendees, and uh, and like let us know who's here with us. First of all, like let's start there. Who's in the webinar? What's your title? Where do you work? Tell us about yourself. <laughs> okay, don't worry, Asa. You have four days to hit your entire quota. I hope you're not starting from zero. <laughs> Mark's here. Okay. Mask Medical, Dale, he's a CEO from Louisville. Hi, Dale. A couple owners, that's pretty cool. Lots Nick of BDRs, of SDRs, yeah. love it. Director of sales at Smart b and Michael Woodhouse, collaborative drug discovery account manager. Bunch of SDRs. Head of growth at G-Squad. Good range of people. All right, um, so guys, continue to use the chat. Ask questions there. I'm watching it like a hawk. I promise I got you. Um, you can feel free to talk to each other too. But what I want to start with is just Colin, if you wouldn't mind. Can you tell us like how we got here to where we are today, talking about these four pillars in a smarter way of building an outbound process? Yeah, uh, I'd love to. And and I wish I had like a a beautiful rosy. We are the hero kind of story. Um, but unfortunately, can I swear? Swear? Yeah. No swear? Okay. Uh, no rules. Uh, unfortunately, we got here through just fucking up a whole bunch. Um, we, I think the only reason we're, you know, we've gotten any better at anything is we've just had more at bats to fuck up. And we've had a team that's sort of consistently focused on, all right, next time we're going to get just a little bit better and a little bit better. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been those like, I, I'm an entrepreneur and this is, we're like seven years into this company and it's been tons of ups and downs. And like every down, you kind of get into this like, oh man, like 
why does it have to be so hard? You know, and then you realize like, okay, well, if, if it was easy, everybody would do, everybody would be doing it. And then when you get to the other side, you're like, oh shit, every time it was hard coming out the other side made everything so much better. Right. And it's, it's the, I don't know, like maybe our, my SDRs and account execs and <clears throat> sales leaders on the call can relate. Cause I spent my life in sales before I started this company. Um, and so I, I've sort of been there with like, you know, those hard quarter quarters where you're trying to hit your quota, those, those really tough months where you, you just can't seem to squeak out a meeting or a sale, no matter, you know, if your life dependent on it. And, um, and I, I remember having actually the opposite, uh, the exact opposite of this a couple of years ago, um, coming around the end of 2018, about a year ago, um, our company was kicking ass. We, we had sort of, we were on path to within a month, we were going to double the size of the company within a, in a 12 month period. Which wow. is we're a bootstrap company. Um, we're pretty stoked. Yeah, um, that's rarefied it, air. Yeah, and so it's sort of the opposite of what I was talking about before. Um, but what I realized was, you know, that that actually got us got us really cocky, um, and we we sort of yeah we kind of lost sight uh, of a couple of things. And it, it all really came came to head around Christmas. We you know we've got a data science team. We were having them look at sort of all the combined metrics from all the campaigns and say, okay, well, let's, let's find some, some really beautiful, you know, smart stuff that we can share with our customers and share on blogs and webinars like this and make us look like really intelligent people. And um, we, didn't, we didn't actually find that. Our, um, our team came back with something more, arguably more important, um, but I was much less excited about. And uh, it was the beginning of a, a giant kick in the pants uh, one of those sort of like downswings, because um, what we realized was we'd set up these like core um, email campaigns. It was just email only. We had a specific way of doing it, um, and just to monitor sort of the the average kind of health of email as a channel. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, we hadn't been we'd been watching them, but we hadn't been looking at them their data in in aggregate. And what we realized is that what we saw in December was that email had actually, over the last 18 months, just email alone had lost, has, had become almost 18 months, probably actually 36 months, become almost just a standard email campaign, 10x less effective. Whoa. Wow. It, it was one of those That's like scary. frog and hot yeah. water, boiling water kind of scenarios where it gets just a little bit harder, a little bit harder every time. And, uh, and it, in looking at it, I was like, how did, how did we miss this? Right. And I, I got to say, I was a little bit hesitant because I'm like, Hey, we, we've got some customers that send, like we, we do a huge amount of email. It's like, we've got super differentiated stuff where we're doing like the, the really high end, like you know, personalizing everything, your social email, you know, phone, like the, the full package. And then you got customers on the other side that are just like, no, we want to email everybody in the entire world. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe it's just a couple of bad customers that are like, if we pull them out of this sample, maybe it's just who they were going after and, and their approach. And, uh, and so we sort of looked at the data and tried to make sense. Couldn't find a way to make sense. And we tried this a couple of, with a, a couple of different variations, a couple of different ways of like looking at the data or pulling out different customer segments or this and that. And we didn't find anything that really resonated. And so this, this was like kicking the pants is nearly in full swing. Like it's, it's starting to hit Gene. And um, the, what we decided to do was basically talk to all of our customers. Hmm. And, and we just, we wanted to get a sense for, okay, if we don't well, like, here's some data. If we don't understand this data, we better figure it out. And so what, what better way to do it than to interview all of your customers. And what we found was sort of, two really distinct groups. And I'll give you the sort of short version, not the longer version, because I, I, coming from sales, I could talk for hours and not say anything meaningful. But basically what we found <laughs> after all this testing was, it's, it's my gift, what can I say? <laughs> 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 was, was basically two distinct, distinct groups of customers. And one group basically said, we want, we know who we want to go after, and we want you to, we just want you to sort of pour some gasoline on that fire. And the other group said, we're not quite sure who we want to go after. We want you to help us validate and test and validate. And, and when we looked at the data, you know, we thought, okay, well, maybe it's these two groups. Maybe it's the companies that know, um, that know who they want to go after, but aren't quite ready 
um, or that know who they want to go after. And then the ones that aren't quite ready, maybe those are the ones that are dragging down the average. We tried to, mm -hmm. tried to match it up, it didn't make any sense. So we, got, we went back and we did another round of interviewing and, what we, and we, we decided, okay, we need to like toughen up here. Because the first round, we were a little bit soft. We were a little bit giving them the benefit of the doubt. And so this time, what we, lo what we looked at was, okay, well, what if we, what if we like double down on how, on if they're actually, like how they know they're actually in this group, right? You say you need to know, you know who you need to go after, but how do you really know that? What is your verifiable yeah. proof? And once we got that layer deep, deeper, we found that like what looked beautiful and amazing and like a really well thought out ideal customer profile and plan, et cetera, was actually just like garbage heaped on top of bullshit and, and not, for, <laughs> not for everybody. Um, but yeah. I would say about, you know, there was a, a significant portion and I would say, and I'm not saying they were all bullshit. Like I'm, I'm exaggerating because we're on a webinar, but what we, when we really got down to it and like, we're actually tough on our customers uh, through the interviews, we realized about 20% had verifiable proof that here's this target segment. Here's why I want to go after them. And, and more than just, Oh, I've got one case study. Uh, we had one customer one time. We have a lot of customers that are exploring new markets. We have a lot of customers that are sort of doubling down on existing. Um, but what we found was the big difference was just the the amount of time and effort that had gone into actually figuring out, okay, this is exactly who I want to go after, and this is why. And, and it was a little bit more complicated than that, but the this is the sort of short version uh, of the story. Um, and, and, and So I imagine like a lot of the people who – and I, this might go for every week, not just this webinar, but people who tend to subscribe to Sales Hacker or, you know, sign up for a webinar, there's something that gets them over that line. And I think like the analogy you used, the frog in the slowly boiling water is like a mm -hmm. good one where somebody just looks around one day and goes, you know, this is BS. Like I'm not, it, it just doesn't feel right. Like I'm, I'm churning through accounts. I'm hitting activity numbers. I feel like I'm doing it right. I'm not making traction. Um, so I love the fact that you, but I love the fact that you double clicked on, um, like your first round of questioning. Cause what at sales hacker, we run a community survey every year mm -hmm. and, um, all like 90% of the value comes from when I actually give a call. Like I spend a week or two weeks just on the phone with some of the respondents and I call them up and ask them about their responses. Um, and the responses they gave in the survey, not that valuable. When I double click, it's usually like an eye opener. Um, Anyway, okay, that's an aside. That totally. process, Heather, for you, does that bring anything to mind? Like, I mean, we were just talking before the webinar about how your team has beat quota <laughs> like three months in a row. So we were like, oh, that's not that relatable, Heather. Um, but I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, sure, get off this call. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure like there's been times in the past where you've kind of had to take a pause and like reevaluate, right? Yeah, so I mean, my story is a little bit different as, as people might have seen and that um, coming from being a mental health specialist for 13 years and then getting into sales, being an SDR when I was 35 is a completely different journey and path. But for me, everything is relational. And the reason I took what I was for 13 years at Children's Hospital into my career now is everything I was doing then was building relations to try to teach healthier behaviors and almost sell a different approach to treating life, to treating different situations, to parenting. And in the world I'm in now, I feel like 80% of it is building relationships and the fact that people buy from people they like. And we all know that. So to me, the kicker for my team is how do you build rapport right from the get-go and stand out and be different and not super salesy and not super pitchy, but like consultative. We want to know if we can help you. If we can, let's shake hands, let's partner, let's move forward. If we can't, let's fist bump, you know, check in later and know that I will haunt you in your dreams in about eight weeks. <laughs> so it's a little bit, it's a little, it's a little bit of that, but, but I probably have learned my most over the last few years of customer panels and saying what worked for you guys to get across the line. And it's short and concise. It's quick asks. It's quick value props that gets people across the line and not so much the long winded salesy um, tactics that people just, I mean, me as a decision maker, I go, uh, delete. Like I, yeah. I need to know, I need, we need quick, like time and a sense of urgency is what closes deals. And that's what also starts conversations. Right. And you don't get that sense of urgency without 
knowing if the fit is right first, if somebody's actually feeling the pain. So you're both arriving at the same point, different places. Yep. Very cool. And Scott Tresky, um, just to give you a shout out, says that he loves your out of the box approach and like how you arrived at sales, Heather. Um, there are a lot of people like that. A lot of like, you know, for t people with um, training as teachers who end up in sales too. So um, yep. anyway, so we're both at the same place, arrived here different ways. Um, Colin, we're here to talk about really like the four pillars approach to like, maybe you don't have to end up in the hot water and look around and have your world be falling apart before you get to where Colin and Heather are at. Maybe mm -hmm. they can hand down some tips and reverse engineer their process. So that's what the four pillars are more or less, right? T totally. Yeah. I mean, basically what we're going to do is we're, we're talking a little bit about the sort of what the four pillars are, how we look at them. And then we're going to jump into something we call chains of relevance. And it's a, it's a way of essentially breaking down your message into an, into an atomic level. And then we'll go through each one of those atoms and how to sort of stitch them all together. Um, that's probably my favorite part of this is a lot of this came from our collaboration uh, between, you know, sort of myself, um, our outbound labs team, the account strategy team, our senior leadership team, and one individual particular on our team, our chief product officer, Kenny, he comes from a product management background. Um, he was with me on all the customer interviews and he brings a very, um, yeah, organized mind to the process. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to jump into sort of the four pillars and then we'll jump into the, the relevance chains and then we'll talk a little bit about how to build them and why you should think about using them uh, when you're sort of testing and trying to validate your outbound strategy. Because I, th I think cool. the absolute worst thing that you can do is, is buy something um, buy a tool that's going to help you scale up something that isn't working because all then you're going to just nuke your target account list, right? Like you want to get a sense for who are the right people to go after. What's the right approach with each of them in the most, and you want to learn that in the lowest cost way possible so that you're not, you know, you don't figure out what the right thing is just as you've sent that last email. And now you're like, okay, well, what do I do next? I've called, emailed, phoned them all with the wrong message. So this is sort of the, the way, a, a way of trying to figure that out ahead of time before we, before we invest too much in going down the wrong path with the wrong, wrong message. Make right. sense? Love it. Makes sense. Yeah, let's jump in. Cool. So basically what we found was essentially four pillars. Um, and we found a, we, we created a way to break them down and, and help us solve this for ourselves and help us solve this for our customers. Um, and really those four pillars are, I'm not trying to tease you, um, it's basically targeting, messaging, channel, and tactics, right? And the way they break down, targeting is basically who you reach out to, right? It's, and it's not just who, it's, it's who plus how you built that list. If that's the, I think that's the best, most articulate way I can say it, right? Like there's, it's one thing to say, okay, and it's super helpful if you're company is giving you a target account list. If you're getting that um, as, a, as a rep, as a manager, like this piece, you don't have to worry about so much, right? Because you hope that your company, the hope is that your company has done some validation and does, has done some digging. And we have absolutely run into organizations where that is the case, where the senior team is working with the product team, is working with the sales and marketing team. Um, but really the, like what we see is that the majority of cases that, that this wasn't the case is the, the targeting that was handed down was basically, hey, we need to grow the company. I wanna figure out how to find more customers Dear sales, dear marketing, please go do that. Well, who are our best customers? Have a look at the case studies on our site. Okay. Right. And so then you get these sort of strange clusters that may or may not be representative of the sort of true market. And so when we talk about targeting, it's really how did you come to that answer? How do you and how did you come to the answer? And then how do you articulate that answer into a tool, into a database that's going to give you your target account list and then your target contact list? Yeah, so that's it. But that makes sense, right? Like that approach of let's just go get more of our already successful accounts. I think that makes such intuitive sense. Mm -hmm. So like, what's wrong with that? And I'll take an answer from either of you on that one. Heather, if you've experienced uh, other ways of, of finding a great target, uh, or if you think that's the right way, I'll take it too. Uh, I, I actually do think it's the right way. So yeah, no, I do. And I'm not saying, and again, I'm not saying it's the, it's the wrong way um, in general, basically. But I think just saying, hey, sales team, here's a case study. Go find more customers that look like this. And if that's the only piece of information that you give them, you run the chance that, you know, they, they double click on the wrong 
sort of firmographics or demographics, or they don't fully grok the right reasons. This is not gotcha. necessarily about the approach of, Hey, these are our customers go, you know, go find more. It's more I about see. the interface between how we got to that decision, articulating that in full, you know, here's the firmographics, demographics, et cetera. So that's really where we sit on the, the targeting side of things. The messaging, basically, it's not just your, it, we're not thinking about cold calling scripts or email templates or any of that. When I think messaging, I'm really thinking about sort of what is that core messaging, right? What is, what is the way that we describe ourselves? What's, how do we, what's the value prop that everybody at Outreach uses when they talk about Outreach, right? What is that core value when you're talking to a sales manager, a sales leader, that you're talking about, right? And, and you're going to have different personas, but what are those sort of the core elements to that messaging? And so they don't look like scripts. They don't look like email templates. They look like just sort of a couple of paragraphs, maybe a couple of bullet points, right? So that's what I think about uh, with messaging. And basically, then it gets to channels and ba channels is essentially sort of where you're going to start these conversations. Um, and then tactics is sort of the how. That's the playbook. That's the team. That's the you know, the tools, that's, that's all those things. Um, and what we found is that when we look, when we broke out our customers and we kind of scored them this way, that, you know, each of these pillars, if you're not doing a great job, they sort of multiply by zero, mm -hmm. right? So basically if you score yourself on a scale of zero, one, two, two is awesome. One is, uh, we think we're good, but you know, maybe there's some work to do. And then zero is, uh, you know, maybe. So if your messaging is amazing, if you've got your, you're in all the right channels and your tactics are totally solid, you got somebody like Heather, that's sort of like making sure everybody is, you know, running all on all cylinders, but you're trying to, you know, point Heather's team at farmers in Nebraska. I don't think we're selling much software. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. It's not, it's not a good match. You're targeting the right people. Well, and I, I yeah, I ahead. think for the messaging, I think for the messaging piece, you know, for us here at Outreach, you know, we have 35 SDRs. And when you start out in our boot camp and a Goji program, we're okay with the fact that people are actually trying to somewhat follow a script or find their way and listen to people to make their own story. And then as you kind of climb segment and get experience, I actually don't use the word script. I use what you're speaking of, of more of the talk track, because you have mm -hmm. to be able to have the ability to pivot with the customer or the client and know where to go with your messaging. Um, and then that's where things get more and more interesting. If you're in person at an event or at a conference, or you're having the ability to chat um, more casually over LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, I completely agree with the messaging piece. Totally. And like, there's nothing worse than being at an event and somebody's, you know, you're, you're listening to some salesperson and it's like, you're clearly trying to recite a script and it doesn't, yeah. I was just talking to you and then you moved into script mode. Um, right. So that, that's why we kind of put tactics is like, if you've, if their scripts are dialed, then, you know, you, you can sort of, I lump that in under sort of the, the tactics piece. Um, Cause the, yeah, if you're, if it's dialed, but it's the wrong messaging, if they're talking about the wrong things, it's not going to resonate. It's not going to land. Right. And so basically right. we learned each of these pillars kind of multiplies by zero. Mm -hmm. A couple of pieces, we kind of look at them as in sort of in two groups, right? There's the, the targeting and messaging. These are totally unique to the company. And in some cases, they're even totally unique to the product or service that you sell. If you change sort of, if there's a, another product, another service, you can't just copy and paste that. Right. If we're, right. if you're and basically, this is nothing new, right? Like everybody on the call, if you're trying to sell outreach to a CEO of a, you know, company with a couple of sales per people, you know, maybe they got five reps, 10 reps versus a VP of sales with 30 reps, it's going to be a much different conversation. Right. So that's right. sort of the, that's sort of the key point is that those are going to be um, specific to your company, specific to your product, the tactics and the channels, those are, those aren't going to vary as much, right? Those are going to vary maybe market to market, maybe who you're based on who you're going after, right? Like if you're going, mm -hmm. if you're going after say CFOs versus, you know, HR professionals, right? Like they're, they're going to use different channels, but it's not going to vary, you know, it's, it's not going to be a crazy variance where the, it, you can't just take things and sort of copy and paste a little bit. And the last piece right. is that those tactics and channels, you can copy and paste from others, 
right? You can, you can learn about these on podcasts. You can't go on a podcast or, or go on to Sales Hacker and, and, ha and they're going to have an article and be like, hey, do you work at startup company X? Here's exactly who you need to target and why. And here's how you yeah. sort of, yep. you know, here's all that broken out. And so the, yep. the messaging and the targeting is something that needs that internal focus um, from people within the company. And then you can copy and paste the channels and tactics. And the, and the last kind of point I'll, I'll, I'll note here, because this is one of the biggest problems when I say people don't have this dialed, is that they, they had it dialed at one point. Is that mm. at one point, they put a ton of thought, work, research into this, and then the market changed, right? And it changed slowly, like that frog in a pot of boiling water, um, to the point where you, you look back, you're like, oh, I don't really recognize it, or you've got some assumptions about, oh, maybe things haven't changed quite as much. And so this, the sort of this, these pillars, the messaging and the targeting and the channels and tactics, they all need to be updated on a continual basis. Um, it's not just something mm -hmm. that you do this exercise once and then, and then you're done with it forever. I liked your note about the messaging and how like, you know, you can't take a templated approach. And one of the things that we have at Sales Hacker is templates. And um, we're actually a little bit, like we talk about it as a team, whether we should take them down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people ask for them. That's why they're up there. A lot of people download them and use them. Um, but we all know that they would be best served by, I think, okay to start with a template and use it as a jumping off point. In our hearts, we hope that they use, that they test very quickly and improve upon them and customize for their own channels and their own targets and, you know, their own company and solution, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I've had, had the same conversation with Aaron. He was, when he, when he wrote Predictable Revenue, he was torn about whether to put his templates in the book or mm -hmm. not. And yeah. he, he's like, well, it's a printed book. So he opted to take them out because he didn't want people just copying and pasting and just using those because that is just going to accelerate those templates dying. And it <laughs> right. sort of, it pulls you out of the, like that creative moment of, okay, I'm, I'm actually going to hunker down and do some work here. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, um, we have a couple questions, if you don't mind, if I just throw a couple out here. Yeah, jump um, in there. One is from Victoria, and this is just kind of a logistics thing, but she's wondering if you have a PowerPoint that we can share um, where this is all summarized. Yeah, totally. After the, after the talk, okay. Yeah, so if, um, if you're registered, we'll send out a PowerPoint that summarizes some of this after the talk. Um, but if you have questions about what we're talking about, ask them now, because like the PowerPoint isn't going to answer your questions for your situation. Um, so speaking of like targeting and Heather, you gave the example of like, you know, sometimes selling to people or being in a situation where someone thinks they want to buy and then they find out eight weeks later that it wasn't the best fit, something like that. Um, somebody asked about BANT and that particular, you know, part of the equation. I don't know if that fits under one of your pillars neatly, Colin, but um, who was this? Graham asked, Bant is dead. What's the replacement? I, I, I didn't see Bant's obituary. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm, we, I can't, I'm like, I can't wait for your answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, per, I think it depends on, um, on the dollar value and the complexity of your sale. Mm -hmm. Personally, like I grew up uh, using Bant um, for certain sales. I'm a big fan of Medic or MedPEC right now. Uh, we dropped the P uh, because just for our sale, you know, we're kind of 30 to 150K. Process doesn't play a huge part in it. Um, if you're curious about like why I'm such a big fan, I did a podcast with Jamie Buss from Zendesk um, and she forecasts their, she's their VP of sales and she was forecasting their quarters within 1% of revenue every quarter. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, she came on the show and, and taught me how to how I did it. I can I'll send you the link there, um, but I, I don't know if I would say Bant is dead. I I would say that sort of the way that we use these tools, the way that we use these frameworks, has needed to evolve. And if you're simply on a call looking for Bant, and if you think Bant is the only reason why somebody's going to buy from you or not, then I think you're using we might be using the methodology wrong, right? Like we mm -hmm. use Medic internally. And just because we have a medic deal that scored 14 out of 14 doesn't mean that deal is going to close. It just means the rep did their homework. It means that we know all we need to know about that opportunity, right? And I find that it's medic in combination with having proper stage definitions that really actually tells you as a sales rep, tells you as a sales leader, this is where we think this deal stands. And this is, this is how much, um, 
this is how much we know about that deal. So this is how much we can trust that stage. It's never going to be like a perfect forecast for this deal is going to close or not going to close, but it's going to give you as much information. And that's how we use these. And uh, that's how we use our qualification framework. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to hear Heather's, Heather's thought here on, on uh, Bent dying, dying and uh, whether or not it's come back to life. No, I don't, I don't, I don't have much actually to add besides that. I, can't, I, I actually agree with you. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, in some ways, you like go. if you've read Predictable Revenue, it's maybe a bit hypocritical to just not uh, acknowledge the fact that part of like one part of Aaron's book was like cold calling is dead. And then at the same time, the methodology is like cold call, email, social. So I think there are people that are trying to like, you got to sell books, you got to write posts, you got to get clicks. So I think a lot of people sort of, you see a lot of posts about this kind of stuff. Um, it's yeah, and I, I feel like I'm just like a, a plug machine right now and I'm sure we'll get to Heather, but we started this outbound labs thing to actually test out a bunch of these, the things that we read on sales hacker, the things that we see on LinkedIn. Um, and basically the, um, like run them through our team and actually test them on live customers. And then we document the results and we've just started rolling out the, uh, um, the, the results on our YouTube channel. So you can check it out there. And there's my plug Colin. Thanks for letting me jump in there. <laughs> yeah, that's a great plug. That sounds um, super cool. I'll subscribe. <laughs> cool. I kind of, uh, the way that I kind of coach my team or, or the way we kind of do things here at Outreach is that I like to say that I give my team a recipe and the recipe involves a little bit of everything, but really at the end of the day, if you're, if you're making a great meal, it doesn't really matter how you get there. So I'm going to tell you ideas and KPIs and, you know, LinkedIn messaging and touches and emails and all of that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's everyone's own bag. And especially when you get to the enterprise space where I manage about how they want to get things across the line. So if they don't follow the recipe and they get there, I'm not going to argue with them or if they follow the recipe to a T because that's the only way they can get there. That's usually a, a younger rep then then that's okay too. But um, I kind of, that's my way to look at it in terms of all these different types of messaging is here's a suggestion, depending on the segment you're in, whether it be emerging corporate or enterprise for us, try this. We think this will work. We have data that shows it will, but if you do it a different way, like cool by you, go for it. I love that. And to extend your recipe metaphor, what you end up with, it sounds like is not line cooks. What you end up with after, you know, they've bathed in it for a while and felt the way around is a bunch of chefs who can right. kind of on the fly, depending on a situation, make real judgment calls instead of just following a rote approach that may not, may, maybe like on average works the best, but doesn't always work. Yep. And you, you know, your younger reps are going to need, need a little more of that recipe following and, the people that get to the tier of, you know, the, the 12 reps on my team, they're breaking the rules of the recipe and showing how they made something awesome from it and then trying to expand and teach on that. So it really helps with growth and development within the organization too. Great point. Love it. Cool. So I, I was thinking, and I love the recipe approach and I love this, the sort of the chef idea. I think we should call chef, call you chef Heather now. If that's cool. <laughs> Sure. Cool. And so it's a, it's a helpful analogy because basically what we're going to do is break down like how to build your messaging into the, into the individual ingredients. And then we're going to talk about how you cook them up. And because basically the way we see it, the way I look at it is like targeting is basically how you isolate who you're, who's most likely to be your best customers, right? It's however you want to do that. And then the messaging is, is basically what you say to get the conversation started. Right. So if we're thinking about it, it's on the one hand, and I'm going to try and talk with my hands without like hitting my mic. That's why my right hand is a little bit <laughs> awkward because this little piece is right where my hand wants to go. Um, but basically, <laughs> it's like you got to extract a piece that's relevant to what your customers or your potential customers already want. And that's on the targeting side, right? And then on the messaging side, you got to figure out, you know, what your offering can do to help with what they already want to do. Right. We're, we're not magicians. We're not manipulators. We're not, you know, you salespeople can, can kind of get a bad reputation. If you think of like your used car salesperson as like, oh, I'm going to manipulate and trick you into buying something that's impossible to do over the phone, email, over social media. Right. 
all that we can hope to do is find people you know, in a very efficient way and start a conversation with them about something that we believe is going to be valuable to them and is going to actually help change their life, their company, their job for the better. Right. And so that's really what this, the whole methodology is about is sort of creating, finding a way to sort of like create that link of relevance between what they already want to do and what we can help them with. And so right. when we, when we talk about like building these chains or building these recipes, if we follow the chef analogy, what we start with is the goal, right? What's most important to the prospect? Right? What is, what is their, you know, what are their KPIs, right? How are they measured? Right. If we're selling to a VP of sales, right, it's pretty, you know, I, I think the people on this call are going to know that. But I'd say, you know, a large number of people, a large number of people I've talked to, you know, they probably, they might not be able to clearly articulate it. And so looking at job postings, doing your research there to figure out what are the goals, right? What is the, what is the lens through which your customer or your, your prospect sees the world? And this isn't just the customer in general. This isn't just one or two customers. This is for this, for a customer that works at this company that has this specific job role, this is the, this is what they're responsible for. And this is the specific thing that they're trying to do. Right. And so it starts with, what are they trying to achieve? What is the, what is that little bit of progress that they're trying to make for the company? Right. And so that's, that's kind of the first sort of link in the chain. Right. The next piece that follows from that. And so let's, let's take an example with, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess outreach because that's sort of the simplest, simplest one that I can think of, right? When you're you're selling to a VP of sales or a director of sales development, uh, if they if they have one, maybe a sales manager, right? What's the you know the progress that they're trying to make is they're trying to book some more meetings for their right, you know, for their their salespeople, right? Above yep. and the, and then and sort of that's the I would say that's going a level deeper. That's sort of the job that they need to do, which is the next box, right? They want to book some mm. meetings for their salespeople. Above that, what do they really want to do? They want to hit their quota, right? They've got goals, right? They've got a KPI. They've got a certain number of pipeline that they need to attribute to this, this quarter. They have a certain number of meetings, a certain number of ops, a certain number of X, Y, Z, right? This is, these are things that you can figure out by like reading the job postings, interviewing some of your customers. Right? So it starts call the- it. So on that level, I'm curious, I love the job to be done framework and I'm excited to talk about that too. But on that level of like what they want to achieve, achieve um how much do you and both of you get into thinking about like the psychology of that like what's the feeling that a vp of sales has when they hit their number do you guys think about that do you talk about that and build that into your process of like they feel safe and secure in their job they feel confident in that they have time to manage their team instead of looking at like which deals are going to come in and which aren't do you spend time talking about like the emotional state it I do. I think it's, I think it's huge to touch on the fact that information puts people at ease. So that's the psychological piece is that people always feel better when they know information. And if we want to plug outreach, outreach is a platform that organizes a reps day, prioritizes tasks for what needs to happen first and foremost, reduces admin work and gives you information that puts you at ease so you can do your job. And as a manager, that's for me, big picture. And as an IC, that helps them just do the basic things like their dials, their recipe, their get their sal to build their pipe, things along those lines. So I, I think there's a big psychological piece to it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you can talk about sort of what is somebody responsible for? Or what is the goal? What are they trying to do without getting into the emotional side? And we don't specifically have sort of a link for the emotion uh, or for like what emotional state are they feeling? Um, but we're going to dive into sort of responsibility. What is their goal? Um, you know, what's the impact if that goal isn't hit. I mean, that's the textbook drilling for pain there. Gotcha. Cool. Okay. Cool. And then, so once you've identified like what they want to achieve, you said again, for your example, VP of sales, they want to hit their number. The next level down is jobs to be done. Like the, what they need yeah. to do to do that. Exactly. So if we're, we're going to take the VP of sales, so they're, they're basically, they're one level higher, one level above that, right. Is basically my, my goal is to grow the company. Right. My goal is to sort of hit our overall sales plan, which is going to contribute to the overall growth of the, of the organization. Below that, there, if we're talking specifically outreach, there's going to be a specific top of funnel goal that they're going to need to hit, which is I need to generate X opportunities, Y meetings, however you sort of track it. Then the, the job to be done there is specifically, 
I need something that, you know, my, um, I haven't thought this through uh, for the outreach example, but uh, basically for my salespeople, I need something to help them sort of organize all their tasks so they're not dicking around in Salesforce or in getting lost in tasks or forgetting about things in their email, right? So there's probably a bunch of different jobs to be done that we could drill in on. It's or organize mm-hmm. my tasks. It's mm-hmm you know, not forget things in Salesforce, it's et cetera, et cetera. And so what we'd want to do, and this is, this is sort of where when you're coming up with these chains, we're not going to just write one sort of and just go, okay, company, response, persona, responsibility, et cetera, is you're going to go through an exercise and you're going to say, what are all the potential jobs to be done, right? So if you're working okay. through this and you're trying to do it on your I'm going to pause for one second because Isaac Kadesky. Oh, did I break up for a second? I think my yeah. internet's back. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, guys. you're good. Um, Isaac Kadeski had a really good question. And I think it's the perfect time to bring it up. Isaac's question, how do you reach out to the same customer repeatedly without sounding like a broken record, but still pushing the value of your service? Isaac, I would propose to you that this is how you do it. There are several jobs to be done beneath the goal that needs to be achieved, depending on your persona. And you can message about those various jobs to be done. Um, they all push towards the same goal. Um, there's probably a hierarchy of importance to those jobs that need to be done, but you know, maybe that's one way. Heather, what do you think about that? How do you like repeatedly hit up somebody that without just saying the same thing eight times? Yeah, I think, I think that there's different ways to do it. We, we love to use value props, blogs, ways to just continue to try to add value. If they're continuing to push off, not, not wanting to have a meeting, I just figure out ways and coach my team to figure out ways to continue to add value, continue to put our brand out there. Our company does a great job with our brand on its own, but how to make things specific to their industry, their vertical, and what his specific needs are, then let alone pain. And then I go to relationship building. If I've been on a call and I know that he loves to grab lunch at so-and-so, send him a gift card or, hey, grab a meeting with me and lunch will be delivered before. So a way to build the relationship as well as add the value, find the pain and continue brand awareness until we know they're ready for the conversation, ready for knowledge to be dropped closer to the end of the contract, things along those lines. There's, there's, there's nothing that's fun about being harassed over and over and an SDR can absolutely feel like that's the avenue that's going, but I think there's ways to be creative um, and not doing it with those types of messaging. I, I totally agree. And I think I love what, the way you said it is like, there's, there's so many ways to be harassed. And, and it's funny, there's a fine line between sort of being, being harassed and being pleasantly persistent. Right. And I think yep. the sort of the difference is the customers or prospects perceive you as harassing them when what you're re- reaching out about isn't relevant. And there's no chance right. that this is actually going to help them and make progress in their life. When yep. you're pleasantly right. persistent, it's when they see you as pleasantly persistent, this is something that's, hey, it's valuable, but maybe the timing just isn't there, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. if, all right, and so that's- Well, the, and, then, and, and we all know, you never know when the timing's gonna be right. So being pleasantly mm-hmm. persistent is when you finally get so-and-so to go, yes, actually perfect that your email came because boom, I mean, how many times SDRs or AEs get things across the line because of timing and it's being pleasantly persistent and always adding value and not hitting on the same points. Um, you have to be creative. Creativity is huge. Strategic is huge. Consultative, huge. Um, those are all things that I think get it across the line. Exactly. Yeah, I can say as a buyer, like, I mean, maybe I like to be wooed more than others or something, but um, the salespeople that I end up listening to are the people who uh, just seem really genuinely interested in me as a person. And I know they're probably faking it, but they're really good at faking it. Like they can reach out and have a conversation with me about what I care about and what I'm ready to talk about, about my work and not mention their product at all. And especially when you're trying to sell to an enterprise where you need a huge amount of stakeholders and champions and you have to push through challengers and it's going to take a really long time anyway, you might as well work on building a whole lot of rapport. And basically like, I know it's just kind of a silly analogy, but make some friends, you know, mm-hmm. yep. talk about something other than what you're trying to sell. Yep. Um, yep. And, and I would add, that big asterisk yeah. that if you're going to put this much effort into trying to generate a relationship, make sure it's relevant in the first place. Right? There's right. nothing worse yep. than marching hundred miles in the wrong direction. Um, doesn't matter how hard you march, you're still not going to get to the right spot. Yeah. That's a good big yep. asterisk. Thank you. 
Cool. So if we go back to our VP of sales, right there, the responsibility is to, is the growth of the organization. The goal is basically, um, they need to add, they need to hit a certain number of new, um, new meetings, new opportunities generated specifically what they're, what they're recognizing is that, you know, they're looking for, they're, they're looking for more meetings. They need sort of more meetings to turn into that more pipeline. Then we get into the obstacle and the friction, right? Okay. So, and this is sort of the next step. Okay, so what is that friction? Then why, why aren't your SDRs um, you know, creating the pipeline? Okay, well, and here's where we, you can have multiple reasons and it's okay. And it's actually great to sort of brainstorm a ton of different options like we mentioned before. The trick is with when you're writing the messaging and coming with the targeting, you wanna make sure it's sort of, you know, you're, just, you're just hitting on one of each, right? We're gonna brainstorm a ton together, but you wanna make sure you've got one and you're gonna have up to like, when we do this, we'll have up to 40 different chains, 40 different variations or iterations of a single potential um, like hypothesis, hypothesis, right? And so if we're you go, coming back to our, our VP of sales, the obstacle or the friction for me is my salespeople are maybe a bit disorganized, right? My, you know, maybe they are not regularly hitting their call blocks. It's like, okay, well, why aren't they hitting their call blocks? And you can sort of drill down. And then we get to the end of the chain and it's product or service, right? So if we're outreach, how do we help solve or remove that friction, right? If we're looking at the, somebody trying to get their job done, this product is going to sort of remove that friction. And the, the, you know, if there's a kink in the hose, it's going to let that water flow, right? So like, how does your product or service remove that obstacle, remove that friction, right? This is so, what I love about this. I love that you have, you just said what, 30 or 40 chains of these hypotheses? Yeah, here, I can do a quick screen I share and I'll, I'll show you like how we actually pull, pull this together. Um, I can't show you a completed one. Those are, those are my favorite, um, but I'll show you our matrix and we'll share this so everybody's got a chance. Um, but basically what we'll do here is this is just our, our starting template. And then once we, so basically here's our company targeting hypothesis. Here's the persona targeting, persona goal, job to be done, obstacle friction. Here's how we solve it, right? And here's the sort of proof. And, and then we'll come up with a couple tests, uh, messaging tests, way of writing each of, way of writing sort of writing uh, and that core messaging in relation to this hypothesis. And then what we'll do is when we run these tests, we'll actually add on here everything from number of positive responses, number of uh, negative responses, number of neutral responses. We'll break down the neutral responses by type. And usually there are sort of 10 to 15 different neutral response types. Um, and in going through in this, in this way allows you to just learn so, so much. I love that. And my favorite, so like, you know, people will pop into my LinkedIn inbox and ask for sales best practices. And I usually say the only two that I know of are challenge your assumptions and test things. And like, that's your whole world. It seems like Colin is built around that. Uh, it's yeah. a beautiful thing to me. I love it. Cool, man. Thanks. Yeah. And I wish I could take more credit for this. I got to give a lot of credit to uh, our team, uh, Kenny, the Upbound Labs team, the account strategy team. They really sort of developed this. It came out of our, our sort of niche. Uh, Aaron wrote a um, in impossible inevitable, inevitable, he wrote about this sort of niche matrix. And then we had sort of evolved it, evolved it, evolved it internally. And then we, when we started up breaking it down this way, it just took it to a whole new level. So, so I know we've got 12, 12 minutes left. I, just, I was wondering, does, do you think it makes sense to just, we'll quickly go through the other sort of links in the chain and then we can maybe open it up to some questions and I can do a screen yeah. share of the couple hypotheses that we have. And then I have a couple recommendations if people are going to do some, if they want to like go through and validate and test this out themselves. Does that, that, that sounds perfect. That sounds perfect. Yeah. We've got a bunch of really good, like I think pretty rapid fire tactical questions that I want to put to both of you. Cool. Um, so let's, let's talk about the links and then we'll jump to that. Sweet. I, I'm, I'm working off a deck. Like I didn't want to go through the deck because it's, there's like 8,000 slides in there and it's tactically how you do this step-by-step step. and to do it properly. It's an hour and a half webinar or it's an hour and a half sort of workshop that we're going to do in person. Um, and so we'll, we'll just sort of wrap this real quick here. And so basically if I look at the top of the chain, you know, I may as well. Yeah. If I look at the, the, the top of the chain, we started at responsibility. Right. So if I go one to the left, that's persona, right. Who in, you know, who has that, that responsibility in our case, it's the VP of sales, right? And then one more to the left is just the company, right? So 
you know, the, how do we, it's, and it's not just the, the company, it's how we target that sort of group of companies. Um, yeah, I, I can see people can't, can't see the deck. I'll share it in just a sec here. If this makes, makes it much easier. Um, there we go. Perfect. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yep. Yeah, it looks great. Thanks, Perfect. Colin. So here's the whole chain um, as we've, uh, you know, as we've completed it. So it starts with the, the company and, and basically this is what we're just finishing with, which is how do we target the, the company that we're working for? And so like we talked about in the beginning, it's not just the, the company demographics and firmographics and psychographics and technographics. This is like how we built that list. It's, it's all of those things. And how do we translate those into our data supplier? Or how do we translate that into the list we built on LinkedIn? Or how did we translate that into our target account list? Because at the end of the day, you need to be working off a target account list. If you're putting this into Zoom, Discover Org, um, you know, any of the other tools that have sort of integrated databases or you're throwing it into LinkedIn, there are gonna be problems because stuff is gonna be lost in translation, right? And we've, we've run some tests recently where LinkedIn is a great tool and I love SalesNav, but if you're just relying on their, their advanced search to find your target accounts, you are screwed. Because uh, the yeah. first, and I'm sure everybody's noticed this, the first couple pages are like, oh my God, this is dynamite. These are all great accounts. And then you get to page six and you're like, what the hell? This is worse than page <laughs> 1000 of Google. Like, the, <laughs> I, I was searching for software companies in Europe and it's farmers. Like, what's going on here? Um, so basically it's the company I just want to stress. It's how you built that list. It's not, it is, it does include sort of the, firmographics and demographics, but it's also how you built that list. All right. All right. So, so there's the whole there. chain. We'll leave it there. Um, we're going to handle some of your questions. I want to say really quickly, I, the irony of this is not lost on me. We got a lot of very tactical questions and I've saved them up and we're going to answer them because that's what we do. We're going to help you out people. But we just talked about how important it is to go through the work of answering these questions yourself using like you know, problem solving and testing and questioning techniques. So just because you got a quick answer from these guys now in the last eight minutes, doesn't mean you shouldn't go like test and think about this on your own. That's my caveat. Can, All I, right. can I add one thing to the caveat? <laughs> sure. If you're going to test this, you're going to want a big enough sample size. So we're talking mm -hmm. like 300 to 500 sort of, you know, 300 sort of people for each. If you're really going to test this, if you're testing sort of a market, 300 to 500 each uh, people each, um, the messaging that you end up writing, don't make this sales messaging, right? You're doing this to learn initially, right? You want to start with uh, really soft uh, asks like, are you the right person on your team to talk about this? Or would you mind letting me know if this isn't relevant? I really don't want to be a bother. I know it sounds like silly Canadian messaging, um, but it works really, really well. Don't go for the call. To, <laughs> don't go for a call to action. That's like, Hey, let's book a meeting. You want your goal to, is to learn not to book a meeting at this stage. hundred percent. And then make yep. sure that you are, um, make sure that you're classifying each of the responses plug for outreach. I know they got some cool tech coming. That's going to be helpful with this that I'm looking forward to um, and classify each of the responses and really look at that across each of the hypotheses. I will share that. Uh, I will share the slides and I will share the matrix. So if you want to replicate this, definitely check it out. Um, we, there's some other resources if people want like the full workshop version. We're thinking of recording that at some point. So call them back to you for questions. Cool. Okay. Um, we can rapid fire these and like, you know, throw out your best one to two sentence answer for each of you. So how concise should an email be? Loaded question, Heather. Um, I feel like a quick opening line. And then what I've heard from customers is bullet points, a quick, hmm. quick snippet that's easy to read. When I see anything that's four to five paragraphs, it's like delete. You got to have quick eyes on it to be able to see. And then the other pieces, when you're hitting up enterprise, you can't have a lot of links in it or pictures because it'll get caught in spam caught filters. Caught in firewall or spam filters. Yeah. Where do you yep. land on that, Colin? Totally agree. Um, I think make sure you're writing it for your mom who reads on her iPad with 600 font. So it, yep. if it can all fit on a page and be parsed easily, like actually look, you know, I find a lot of sales development, rep, development reps are, you know, tend to be on the younger side of things. And have great eyes and you don't and you it's easy to forget that if you want somebody to be able to read your message on a phone 
um, and you wanted them to be able to parse it really quickly, that you can't have things grouped together. Like, I have to see physically what you, be able to read it. Yeah, see what your message yep. looks like at size 60 yeah. font and see how ridiculous and hard it is to look at because that's that's, that might be who you're emailing. Yeah, good point. Um, all right, so for targeting, uh, how much time and effort would you put into like building a custom database, especially if you're selling to companies like startups um, and you have tools like Crunchbase and LinkedIn, can you kind of just cobble something together? Like where do you land on the value of a proprietary database you build over time from various sources versus something you can kind of just grab out of the box? <laughs> That's I, all I, you, Colin. <laughs> I have strong, strong opinions. I, I mean, I, I think, I think you, you, need a, you need to test and validate who we're going after first, right? Like we, we talked about sort of the, the chains of relevance in building this out. The, like you can build, you absolutely need to build your target account list for, for your account execs, for your SDRs, for et cetera, et cetera, right? You need to have that list. There has to be one list. You can't just go to your salespeople and go, here's the product, go sell some shit. Right, that's an impossible mission. Only a few are going to succeed, and you're not giving yourself the best chance of actually winning. Right, if you see all the account based stuff that's been happening the last couple of years, it's nothing new. Though I love John Miller, I think he writes great content, and Engage is a cool tool, but it's nothing new. It's this this is the strategic account approach from you know 20 years ago, 30 years ago that you know, hasn't really changed that much. The one thing that has changed is that software has made it easier to follow that approach for a larger segment of customers as opposed to just five or 10. Mm. Um, so I'm a big fan of, you've got to have your target account list. You've got to have it nailed. Um, I wouldn't necessarily worry to, so much about sort of like, I don't know, like you want to find the tools that are going to provide relevant data. You want to find out who has great data that's, that's going to fit and help you build out your target pro persona and then make sure you get that into your sales force. And that can be one of the most valuable things that you'll do for your outreach. Cause if you're going after the right people, you know, everything's going to be magic. And if you're going after the wrong people on a crappy list, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter who is running the team. If they're marching in the wrong direction and they're emailing, calling, phoning er, and LinkedIn the wrong people game game's over. Just a waste of time. Wasted effort. Yeah. And you think you're losing when maybe it's just, you know, not, not starting from the right place. Exactly. Um, Heather, you could imagine a, a scenario where like we all think granularity is better, right? Personalization and all that. You could imagine a scenario where we have different messaging or different sequences written for like every different persona at every different type of company and every different industry. And then you end up with like 4,000 different things you could say and you just like, where does it get unwieldy? And how do you decide how targeted to be? How do you like draw the lines around that for your team? Um, constantly looking at all of our sequences. And, and I just had a conversation this morning about how sometimes I feel like we overcomplicate it. Like we really need to kind of tone it back. We have so mm -hmm. much at our fingertips here at Outreach that um, I think that you, you look at what works. So we look at what's booking meetings, what closed, what did they open, what subject line was it, and the A, B testing to know the data coming in then like wipe out the rest and let's mm. try doing this and this. So I often think, you know, in being an, a, an outreach user for a few years now, when I didn't work here and now working here, I'm actually trying to bring in more of a simplistic approach to not get too far into the weeds because I do think sometimes we can overcomplicate it. But, and then sharing success with each other. I love, you know, hitting up on Slack that, someone booked a meeting by doing this or this and they use this subject line or it got opened 14 times and then they called and this happened. So sharing success is huge as well. Um, and just collaborating as a team and really, you know, their job is to, is to break down doors to book meetings. And my job is to break down doors so they can book those meetings. <laughs> That's good advice. So like eliminating the paradox of choice as much as possible, like it, more choice is not necessarily better basically in terms of targeting. Right. Yep. Um, here's another question for you, Heather, from Mitch. Thank you, Mitch. Um, when you're running sequences to the EU, this may be a premature <laughs> question, Mitch. What are some of the best practices <laughs> to ensure your SDRs don't breach GDPR compliance? Well, we are currently not, <laughs> as Colin with 1L knows, calling into the EU, but we are, as we speak, opening up an office there and hiring a sales team. So um, they will be located there and working on those accounts. And my team here in the U.S. is not reaching out to them. Um, but yes, GDPR is a very sensitive issue. And um, so 
training and things is what I've had my teams do in the past with other companies, a lot of training, double and triple yeah. checking, lots of things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, bye, Frank. Thanks for stopping by. Mitch, to your question, um, I'm not a lawyer. Your mileage may vary, but I've found that like a lot of the emphasis sounds like it's on how people opt into your list and then how you deal with handing them information or unsubscribing them when they request it. You need, there may be tools that help you do both of those things. Um, you need to be pretty careful about it. Uh, it shouldn't change your messaging so much as it should change who you're messaging you and out. when. Yeah. 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 I, I saw a couple of comments on like certain tools being GDPR compliant. I, I don't think that's, I think that's a marketing gimmick. Um, yeah. I've tested some of those GDPR compliant tools um, as part of the outbound labs. We haven't published it yet, but we tested uh, a variety of different sort of email sending providers um, and the ones with the, just say sketchier advertising um, and bolder claims, they did very, very poorly because um, Google and our office know how to track down those senders um, and know how to, they understand when email is coming from a certain provider. Um, it doesn't matter where they're based. It matters sort of how they're sending and what they're doing. And um, there's a quite a bit of complexity to like, what is GDPR compliant? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan. I mean, we, we use outreach internally. We tested outreach and there was like no change compared to some of the other ones, but there were a few that really got nuked. And so I would say be very careful. Yeah. Um, all right, gang, that's all we have question, time for, for questions today. We wanted to leave you with two things. Heather has something to say to all you folks who join and think it's relevant. Um, uh, yeah, no, I just would love to say that uh, I'm here to help. I love more than anything to have conversations, build relations with all of you, uh, whether it be professionally or whether you'd be interested in uh, pursuing a career here at Outreach. We're hiring. So uh, please ping me on LinkedIn if I can do anything from here. My email is heather.burke at outreach.io be part of one of the best sales orgs on the planet. And since Heather joined the yes. team, they've surpassed their quota three months in a row. So like, pretty good place to be guys. Um, find her on LinkedIn, Heather Burke. Uh, also the second week of December, December 9th to December 13th. If you didn't know, December 13th is National Salesperson's Day, um, which is a made up holiday, but Sales Hacker this year, we're making it like a real thing. And we're not just doing one day, we're doing a whole week. So what we did was we put together a free virtual conference. Um, we got over 28 speakers. It's stuff like this, but like all day for the whole week. And you can watch them at your leisure. You gotta sign up for the talks you wanna go into. Um, the cool things are free, no sponsors. So you're not gonna get any spam at all from going to watch it. And you can win cool stuff by joining and by telling your friends about it. So go to summit saleshacker.com and reserve your seat. That's December 9th through December 13th. Watch it all at your leisure and we'll see you there. Um, guys. Oh, Vesna. One last thing. Vesna Akrap says, this is one of the best webinars they've ever been on. All useful, no fluff. And I think that's a great note to end on. It's all you, Heather and Colin. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining and making it useful and no fluff. Right on. And I will say we, we covered a, I skipped a ton of ground in this. Mm -hmm. If you are interested in us recording a full, like super tactical, it's going to be sort of two hour webinar where we go through in crazy boring detail. Um, hit me up, call in with two L's at predictablerevenue.com and uh, let me know that you want that. And we'll talk to talk to the team about recording something like that and getting it shared out. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Hope we do this again sometime soon. Wink, wink. And um, <laughs> see everybody who joined, right on. Uh, hopefully at another webinar very soon. Take care, everybody, right and have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Heather. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.